all about the sacrifice made so that victory could be won. I want to turn your attention to a Memorial Day passage of Scripture. You may not know it's one, but it is one. Not our Memorial Day, but one of Israel's Memorial Days. Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. We're going to look at the first seven verses of Joshua chapter 4. And it came to pass, when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priests feet stood firm, you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men 
whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign or a memorial among you when, you, when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. As Marshall put it so eloquently, really, he exceeded what I had asked him to do and I just moved by how he shared what Memorial Day means to him. A lot more, a lot more uh, personal than I could share with you uh, because my military experience is zero. Uh, but this is a weekend that was intended by Congress in 1971 when they made the fourth Monday of May an official national holiday for memory of those fallen who had sacrificed their lives for our freedom. This was intended not to be a weekend that, as I grew up remembering it, the weekend of the big race, the Indy 500, already started. Uh, it's, it, it's not a weekend that was intended to be a weekend for uh, cookouts and the, the unofficial start of summer, if you will. It was not intended for the marketing of big sales events at, at department stores uh, all over the country. It was intended to be a time for us to remember what had been done for us through the loss of life. I've I've made mention of this before. I've got several uh, of my family members who have served in the military, World War II, Vietnam, Korea. Also uh, have a, uh, a second cousin, much younger than me, not much older really than, than William and Benjamin, who is currently in the military, has been over to Afghanistan twice already. Um, and the military has a, a rich heritage within my family roots. And so when we come to this time of remembering what has been done for us, uh, my juices flowed with thought processes. And so I, I began looking for a passage of scripture, and there are monuments all over the place in scripture for uh, what God had done for his people. Joshua 4 is one of the ones that immediately came to my mind. And there are some fascinating parallels to what Joshua and the children of Israel asked, were asked to do by God here in this passage. What we are intended to do with our memorials all over the land, which are uh, innumerable. If you, if you really mark it, uh, there in downtown Indianapolis, uh, the circle is marked by the War Memorial for the State of Indiana, uh, which I, I toured as a boy um, through one of my history classes in elementary school. Um, and uh, you go to Washington, D.C., and there's monuments after monuments after monuments of memories and memorials for the fallen, for those who sacrificed uh, in uh, one war or another. Uh, just a week or so ago, they opened up uh, the uh, National Museum uh, where the Twin Towers once stood for the 9-11 memorial as well. That all takes place and they're all intended to cause us to remember. They all have a purpose involved. And our memorial is the cross. And so as I looked at what Joshua was asked to do by God in Joshua chapter 4, as I thought about the memorials that we have in our own land uh, nationally all over, all over the country, and then I, I looked and thought about the intents of an empty cross, 
I came up with some ideas. This is going to be completely different from the way I usually share from the Word of God. I'm not going to go piece by piece through the Word of God, although we're going to, we're going to uh, kind of pick at it a little bit. But I, I've got a thought process here. I want you to hear me out and understand that this is the heart of God in what we ought to be uh, imagining in our hearts when we think about the cross. First of all, memorials are intended to mark the event in which they note. The first thing that they're supposed to do is, and what I want you to note, is that there's a significance about these stones. There was a significance about each memorial that is marked everywhere, whether it be uh, uh, the Lincoln Memorial or the World War II Memorial or the Vietnam Wall or, or uh, the 9-11 Memorial or whatever it might be. There's a significance about every piece of it, even the stone, the marble. And you can go and you can hear the history and the stories of why the artisans chose particular rocks, a particular stone, and particular, particular shapes and different things to uh, depict the, the story that they wanted to be uh, imagined or remembered. In this case, in Joshua chapter 4 and verse 3, the number of stones was significant. Twelve stones. Twelve stones, which was one for each of the tribes of the nation of Israel, which suggested there was a full unity of spirit about crossing the Jordan. They had the same uh, unity of spirit 40 years earlier when they crossed the Red Sea. They, only had, they had a better incentive to cross the Red Sea 40 years earlier. It was called the armies of Pharaoh. When they crossed the Jordan, there was no reason for them to cross other than God said, it's time to move forward in life. It's time to claim the promise that I have made for you as a people. So when they crossed the Jordan River, there was no danger impending them. They could have decided to remain satisfied on the other side of the Jordan River. But they didn't. They crossed the Jordan River, and they crossed it as a nation, all 12 tribes, even though two and a half tribes had already asked and received permission from Moses and God to receive their inheritance on the side that they were already on because of the type of land that it was, because of the kind of shepherding uh, that they did in those two and a half tribes. So, so these, these individuals, these, these tribes, as one, as one nation, 12 individual tribes, as one people, decided to cross the Jordan River on the dry ground. Not wade through it, but walk through the bottom of it, just like their, their uh, ancestors had done 40 years earlier in the Red Sea. So the number is important. I want you to note, and this is something that hit me yesterday as I was meditating on this for just a little while. You do realize that in this case, the Jordan River and the Red Sea, that even the kids were involved in the harrowing experience. Yo, we look at memorials and we remember men, usually young men between the ages of 18 and 40, 45, that, that put themselves at risk. Sometimes it's older, and in some cases I had an uncle who uh, lied about his age and uh, was uh, in the Philippines as a 17-year-old. So uh, anyway, yeah, it happens. And, uh, uh, but, but usually in that time frame. But in this case, in the case of the Red Sea 40 years earlier, these adults that were crossing over the Jordan had crossed the Red Sea as children. And now they were leading their children across the Jordan River in another effort made possible by God and God alone. So it was significant that they had these 12 stones to depict their unity. Now also it was interesting, the architects, they took the 12 leaders. They picked the 12 most influential men 
and told them to go back into the bottom of the Jordan River while it was still dry and get 12 stones from, the, from around the Ark of the Covenant that was still standing in the midst of the Jordan while people were crossing. We'll get to that significance in just a moment. But they chose these 12 leaders for their influence, their impact upon the people to be the artisans, the architects of the memorial that would be set on the other side. The third thing, and this is where we're going to get back to what we just noted, is the origin. These stones weren't just 12 rocks that they said, oh, these look like good rocks, they'll fit, and they put them together. They went and they got 12 stones from the bottom of the Jordan River while it was dry for them and picked them up from around the Ark of the Covenant. If you look at verse 3 and then at Joshua's uh, description as well, he says, now I want you to go back into the Jordan River. You've already crossed. I want you to go back, you 12 guys, and get a stone and bring it back with you. These stones would have been significant because they would have been marked by the waters of the rushing Jordan River. They would have been smooth in a certain way. They would have been colored in a certain way. They would have been shaped in a certain way. And these 12 men would take those 12 stones and they would set them up together in a unique fashion. Those stones were significant to the story, to the validity of the story of the crossing of the Jordan River. And its totality of action. The fourth thing I want you to note in the significance of the stones is where they would be placed. Not on the side where they started, but on the side where they would complete their journey across the Jordan River. In fact, Joshua told them, now I want you to go get these stones and I want you to set them up where you are going to spend the night tonight in anticipation of the completion. They had not finished crossing yet. But these 12 guys had already gotten across while there were still others coming across the river. Joshua says, God's told me we need to go get 12 stones. So fellas, you 12 guys, go get those 12 stones. And we're going to start setting up this memorial in anticipation of success of this part of our mission. In anticipation of victory. Understand that the cross... The cross for us depicts the completion of victory already made. But Jesus always anticipated the victory that was at hand. Always had it in his mind. Always believed that victory was his. I ask William to lead us in that last song because of the mention of of the return of Christ. I want you to understand that that cross not only depicts our certain victory over sin, over death, over hell. It depicts the absolute future of that victory over sin, over death, over hell, over Satan himself. Because one day Jesus Christ because of that cross, is going to return. He's going to return, and he's not going to return to suffer again, to sacrifice again. He's coming to conquer. He's coming in victory. He's coming to defeat Satan for one, once and for all and to be our king. The difference between the cross as a memorial and what we typically look at is that the cross has a picture of victory. It has a picture of real opportunity for us in the future. Most Memorial Day markers are things that are in the past. Not something that is in the future. Well, I want you to note the sequence of events that was key. And we've mentioned this, but we, the crossing in the Jordan had started. The leaders were already at rest and were being sent back to gather up these stones because the ark's position was still in the middle of the Jordan. 
and the anticipated moment of completion was at hand. That's all part of the significance of the stones and the sequence of events. But now, memorials are not just about marking the event. They're about telling the story as well. One of my most, one of, I guess my, the, one of my favorite memorials to go to in D.C. is the one that marks uh, the, the marking of the flag on Iwo Jima. The first time I saw it, I didn't realize it was so big. It's massive. The Lincoln Memorial, I, the Lincoln Memorial, I, I, th I think I had an idea that it was, it was a big thing. Uh, the Washington Monument, I thought it was a big thing, tall thing anyway. Uh, but I did not realize how massive the memorial for the marking of the, the, the mounting of the flag on the top of Iwo Jima was until I got there. And the intensity of, of what that image entails to the story. Now, if I had a wish about what Marshall had shared, I wish I had been able to put in my mind's eye an image of what he was talking about. You could see he had an image of what it was being, what, what he was talking about. Uh, and to be real honest, I, you know, planes are not my thing, so the difference between a, uh, a C-130 and a C-17 or whatever it is, I'm clueless. They're big planes, okay? Okay? And, and uh, uh, Marshall flies them, and the best I could ever do is ride him one. All right? And... Uh, it would not be smart to do it the other way around. Hey, Marshall, can we switch? Can I fly for a while? No way. That's not happening. The image needs to be real in our lives in order for us to understand the story. And what fades with time with memorials is the depiction of the stories. You can go to Gettysburg and you can get great guides to give you some idea of the story of what took place at Gettysburg. One of my favorite places to go. But you really don't have an idea of how intense the battle was. But for a generation or two, they did. They lived it. Or they told about it in such a way that the children of the ones who fought in it understood what that picture was like. We don't have those images anymore as much. We fail in the stories, in the memorials, to uh, get people to grasp what took place. That's why I'm thankful, in spite of any of its flaws, Mel Gibson's depiction of the passion. Uh, because I think it gives believers, as much as unbelievers, a real understanding of the brutality of the sacrifice Christ made on the cross and before the cross for our sins. You see, memorials do do one thing. They assume future exposure to future generations. Let me say that again. Memorials assume the future exposure to that memorial by future generations. This is what I mean by that. Jesus expects us, God expects us to tell others about the suffering of Christ on the cross. To use the image of the cross to tell others about why the cross is significant in our faith. You go to the memorials and you need to tell your children's stories. When we took the kids to Washington, D.C. the first time and even the second time, we told them the significance of the stories. We asked them, and Leanne is notorious for reading every 
marker. That's why we don't take her to the Smithsonian Institute when we go. Because we would still be there. Because, but, but she wants to know the story so that she can share the story with others, which is a good thing. You see, when you look at a memorial, when Joshua and the children of Israel looked at these stones, when we look at uh, the memorials around the nation about our fallen heroes, when we look at the cross, we need to understand that there was risk involved. The risk for the children of Israel was first started by the priest who had to put their toe into the water before the rivers, the waters of the River Jordan would separate with the Ark of the Covenant in their hands. There's a risk involved. There's a risk for every soldier who goes into battle that is marked by the memorials, the tomb of the unknown soldier. Is a memorial that we need to remember marks the unidentified remains of individuals who put risk ahead of their own safety, who put freedom ahead of their own value so that we might have freedom in this land. Risk is a huge part of every story behind every memorial. The faith that we have to have in our position with God in order to be put in the place where God wants us to be. The courage to act on that faith so that when we serve God in a real way, we understand the risks that others took so that we might be able to live and be what God wants us to be for his kingdom where we are. I will never. Well, I shouldn't say never. I don't anticipate ever being asked to serve in the military. I don't ever anticipate asked to be served to give my life for my country, am I? Marshall has. Others have. And I want you to understand that there's a certain amount of courage that it takes to act on faith in something that you believe in. Jesus did that when he asked the Lord at Gethsemane, Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, I know that you can do this differently, but if this is the lot you have cast upon me. If this is the cup that I am to consume and partake of, let your will be done, not mine. I'll go to the cross. You see, not only do you have to have faith in the uh, mission, Courage to act on that mission. You have to have a determination to finish. Jesus declared, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He finished the task. There's a, deter a determination that needs to happen. That makes it part of the story. I got a letter. I get Samaritan's Purse letters all the time because uh, we've given through Operation Christmas Child and other things. This letter from Franklin Graham is a reminder this Memorial Day of an enemy soldier. This guy's name, you might remember the story, Hiroo Onada. Hiroo Onada was stationed on the island of, let me see, uh... Lubang, in the Philippines, shortly before the end of the war. He was commissioned by his captain. No matter what, under any circumstances, you are to not do certain things. You will never surrender. You will always fight. You will always take care of the emperor's rule. 
You will always engage the enemy, and when you lose your last man, you will continue to fight until someone comes to you and gives you new orders. Surrender is not an option. That was 1944, I believe. 31 years later, Pero'o Onada came out of the hills of Lubang in the Philippines, having been fighting the war for the, the uh, Imperial Army of Japan for 31 years after the treaty had been signed. They forgot about him. And the only reason they could get him to come out, they kept having this guy that would do things, you know, at guerrilla warfare and, and stealing things and uh, bombs and different things like that, all, all kinds of s small things, but the best that he knew how to do, Hiroo Onada was continuing the fight that he had been commissioned to fight with determination. When they figured out who it was, they went and found his captain. 